Hello and welcome to HES's webinar series. Uh, thank you uh, so much for joining us today for the uh, our solar insurance webinar. Um, today we're fortunate uh, to be joined by Hugh Woods Canada um, with uh, with both Jen and Kyle. Um, uh, and we're for the presentation. Uh, if you could please put in your questions uh, in the uh, question area, and we'll be uh, we'll be asking the questions. Uh, at the end of the presentation on your behalf. But thank you again uh, for joining us, Kyle and Jen. Um, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I thought I'd kick off first by just giving you a quick overview of the firm and telling you sort of why we're here and, and what you can expect. So Hugh Wood uh, International is an independent international firm offering our clients full brokerage and risk services. So brokerage claims, uh, risk control and engineering uh, guidance, as well as uh, thought, thought leadership. Uh, we're here today um, to share with you our capabilities, our depth of expertise across the industry and product lines, our, our uh, breadth of market relationships and global footprint that has given us these capabilities and experiences to share with you. Um, our industry experience in managing renewable energy related risks and exposures is second to none. Um, our experience in providing our clients a platform for growth is one of the top priorities that we have. Our consultative approach uh, provides solutions, options and recommendations uh, for you to make business decisions and to manage your own risks a little bit more uh, with your own control. And finally, our risk management framework uh, benefits you. Uh, it benefits your uh, end user, your client. And this stems from contract reviews uh, to looking at your total cost of risk. So with that, we'll, we'll kick this off. Um, we want to talk about obviously setting the stage of why this is important, uh, what the key coverages are, the sort of the, the five whys, um, the price drivers, and uh, some claims examples. And then we'll finish off with some, uh, some Q&A. So just as a quick introduction, insurance is usually, in our experience, uh, one of the last considerations to be made. Um, but with this view, it can be one of the biggest points of frustration uh, for all, all parties involved. By taking a proactive approach and getting ahead of the curve, if you will, uh, makes the whole process more streamlined. And most importantly, it builds mutual expectations uh, around the role of insurance and uh, what, can, what, um, what the priorities are. And the best way to be proactive is to build an understanding around insurance and the role that it, uh, that it plays. And our experience and client base gives us a leading perspective uh, into this industry, which we're happy to share with you. So with that said, I'll pass it over to Jen Aitchison, who leads our renewable energy practice here at Hugh Wood. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks, guys, at HES. Pretty excited to be able to present you. Uh, a little bit about why this is important. People often ask what insurance has to do with solar energy. It's not just about the insurance, but the whole risk management approach to installation, overall operations, and of course, maintaining the system. These are key factors in ensuring power generation equipment remains safe and effective for its intended use over the lifetime of the equipment, which not in some cases, but more often than not, well exceeds 20 years. Not insuring equipment properly while in the course of installation could potentially mean that in an event of a loss, having to replace equipment out of pocket or having to pay for liabilities assumed under contract should lack of review and diligence lead to unknown potential and potentially unbudgeted expenses that should have been required by other parties to the work. We find often that, that people overlook certain contractual obligations to get a contract signed quickly and then when a loss occurs, find that they're on the hook for much more than they'd ever expected. There's also contractual obligations required by system and owners, financiers, landlords, homeowners, and others, which generally dictate the type and level of coverage required for, of installation companies, including limits of liability, types of property coverage, and bonding that may be required. These also need to be reviewed very carefully to ensure you're not signing on to obligations for work you may not be in control of, such as subcontractors or engineering work that you weren't aware of. Careful, careful review is definitely paramount to this process. Some of the key coverages we're going to talk about, uh, property, 
which is going to look at insulation floaters versus a builder's risk coverage, liability, which is the commercial general liability versus a wrap-up cover, professional liability, which tends to cover off the engineer's surety, and warranty. We're going to begin with the course of construction property. Covering property in the course of construction can be done one of two ways, either an installation floater or a builder's risk. An installation floater is fairly common when looking at residential side of things. It covers the contractor's portion of the overall property values during the installation only. So only while you're working on that portion of your work. No coverage for property while it's being worked on by any subs or anybody else. It also could require reliance on evidence of insurance from subs for property coverage in the course of installation. It's almost like having to stitch together bits of coverage to get to a full coverage. It's also settled on an actual cash value basis as opposed to a replacement cost basis. This looks like replacement cost less depreciation. It also generally doesn't include equipment breakdown coverage or losses arising out of the testing and commissioning process, which is incredibly important. A lot of the losses that we see are from an equipment breakdown in that testing and commissioning phase. The builder's risk is another alternative, uh, which we generally prefer our clients use, as it provides more seamless cover. It covers the property value of the entire installation and all contractors and subcontractors until contractually accepted by the owner. It's settled on a replacement cost basis, so there's never any deduction for depreciation of the equipment. It can also include an element of delay in startup, which is advanced loss of profits. This provides coverage for loss of revenue or loss of profit due to delays in construction from a covered loss during the construction period if required by a contract with owner and developer. An example of the covered losses under a delay in startup, it would have to fall under uh, the builder's risk, which would be you know, fire, theft, vandalism, earthquake, hail, flood. It doesn't cover a uh, loss of revenue stemming from a delay in product delivery just to be clear. It also includes equipment breakdown coverage and losses arising out of the testing and commissioning process, which again, as highlighted before, is one of the most important pieces. That tends to be where we see the majority of losses in the construction process. Under either option, it includes coverage for property on site and while in transit. Only inland trucks though, if you've got stuff coming in from overseas or by air, it won't be covered. That would require a special uh, policy for inland marine or ocean cargo. Coverage ceases once the project is substantially complete, which is usually outlined in the contract, accepted by the owner operator or left unattended for 30 days. Now, the last one can be amended to allow for up to 180 days. We find that a lot of projects are complete, but there's delays uh, to COD or financial close. So we can work with insurance companies to amend that, but generally only under a builder's risk policy, not within an installation floater. The major differences, just to highlight, the installation floater is settled on an actual cash value basis. It covers the contractor's operations only, so only the guys doing the work to the portion of the work they are working on at the time, and it excludes equipment breakdown and testing and commissioning. A builder's risk is settled on replacement costs, covers all parties to the contract, and includes equipment breakdown and testing and commissioning. Now we're going to get into the liability side. Uh, just to give a high level, liability is intended to cover off bodily injury or property damage to a third party in the course of your operation. Covering property in the course of construction can be done of two ways as well, through a commercial general liability policy or wrap-up policy. A commercial general liability covers third-party coverage on entities' operations specifically relating to their occupancy or installation exposures only, usually put in place when no subcontractors are being used. And if subs are being used, the contractor must rely on evidence of insurance from all their subs. This can be very administratively heavy, as you've got to make sure that those certificates are up to date and that the insurance is on file are relevant and comply with all contractual obligations all the way up to the uh, end owner and any financier requirements that may be there. A wrap-up liability is a, an alternative to a commercial general liability and it covers a specific project. 
or set of projects and applies to the operations of all subcontractors involved in the construction portions of the specific project. It provides for no reliance on trades and sub-trades limits of liability. So in the event that, that a trade or a sub-trade has had some losses that have exhausted portions of the liability, you don't need to worry about that. Or if they don't have the level of limit that you had expected or required to carry under the contract. It's generally used for larger projects or portfolios in which many trades and sub-trades are used and may also be required by contract. It contains a completed operations period that extends the coverage for liability arising out of the installation beyond the completion date of the project, typically up to 30 month, 36 months as a maximum. Typical is 24 months. It reduces claim settling complications and impact on corporate insurance placements as well, as it typically uh, really sets apart that project. So you're not having to contribute liability limits from anywhere else. It is project specific and any claims that arise from that project would be settled and applied back to this policy. Professional liability is also something to consider if you're doing any design and engineering work. It covers an engineer and designer for alleged error and or omission resulting in a financial loss to a third party. It's usually written on a claims made and reported form, which means that uh, in the event that there's a claim after the project is completed, you need to make sure that there, uh, the insurance is carried forward or a runoff policy is in place. Exclusions to be aware of, efficacy. So all policies for professional liability that I've seen include an efficacy exclusion. It excludes any guarantees of output being made and generally also excludes professional services outside of the scope of work noted on the application. Uh, the reason that's there and to be aware of it is that if you're an electrical contractor working in the residential space, and then you begin to add the services of installing solar arrays, it changes potentially the nature of the work you're doing and the insurance company not knowing that you've added an element of installation of power generation equipment if they're unaware, they may deny a claim in the event something arises from those services that weren't reported to them in the application process. Surety is something you may be required to carry as well. Uh, surety bonds are generally required for large or long-term construction projects and dictated by CCDC contracts used. They're also often required by municipalities, whether they're small or large jobs, and they consist of the following. A bid bond is, is to back the initial project bid. It guarantees that you will be able to uh, complete the job as uh, projected and as quoted. A labor and material bond backs the contractor's payments for labor and material. And a performance bond backs that the work will be completed as outlined in the bid and is agreed for the price it was agreed upon. In the event that any of those things don't come to fruition, the bond can be called and then the bond comes in and pays for somebody else to complete the project in the event of a bankruptcy or other uh, instance that may arise from a labor and material perspective or performance perspective. Warranties. Uh, there is availability of warranty coverage to backstop performance guarantees or warranty related claims on actual products. However, capacity is limited and coverage is broad, which leads to extensive underwriting criteria. A couple different types of policies, design and installation warranty that covers the performance of a system following design and installation, and that's an efficacy cover. So if you're making guarantees of output based on a design and installation you're about to do, there's a policy available to cover off those, although it is somewhat expensive. There's performance and degradation guarantees that some manufacturers do purchase as third-party backed financial instruments. And that, it, again, is purchased by the manufacturer to cover off performance, labor, material, and degradation over the 25-year period. There's also a total project wrap. Uh, however, that, that is limited. There's not a lot of that left in the marketplace. These warranties are typically underwritten by reinsurance. Uh, and reinsurers such as Munich Re, uh, Swiss Re, Hanover, uh, Hartford, those folks. But again, it's very expensive to procure these types of uh, insurance-backed financial instruments and not something that's commonly sold. 
So before we jump into <laughs> some of the price drivers um, and some claims examples, just to quickly summarize, we have property coverage, which is first party, which means that um, it's going to pay for pay you. The check will be written to you as the first insured um, on the policy. There's a general liability policy, which covers it bodily injury and property damage to third parties. So essentially, the insurance company is going to write a check to the injured party, not to you. And then there's the E&O uh, or professional liability, which does not pay for bodily injury or property damage, but pays for that financial loss. And then you have your surety, uh, surety bond, which deals with the uh, performance and um, metrics around getting the job done. And then finally, there's the warranty, which essentially backstops the, um, the efficacy of the, uh, of the project. Okay. Price drivers. So on the general insurance side, as you can see, there's an exhaustive list there. Uh, claims history, construction of the facility panels are installed on. So if you're installing on a uh, commercial industrial building that is masonry, it's going to be a lower price than if you're installing on a wood frame barn with hay in it that is very combustible and likely doesn't have full-time firefighters close by. Uh, operations within the facility, so if you've got you know, an office type exposure, it's going to be less expensive than if you have a warehouse with plastics or a recycling facility in Pi. Fire, lighting, and surge protection are also a consideration. The location of the facility, is it close to schools? Theft and vandalism protection, replacement parts timeline. Uh, we often see transformers as a long lead time. So that can definitely provide um, driver for price as well as deductibles you see. Quality and experience of engineering and installation firms. Quality and type of components being used. Uh, you know, are folks choosing the components that are, are more expensive or are they, are they a little less expensive? Um, size and value of the system obviously takes into consideration. Construction timeline, how long is it going to take you to build the project? So how long are they exposed for? And number of projects annually. Kyle, you want to talk about professional liability? The biggest driver for professional liability is the type of activities that you're undertaking, uh, whether it's um, design, if you're doing some structural work, or, or is it just electrical, uh, or is it both? The next big factor will be the management team and the overall experience. Uh, how long have you been doing this? And of course, have you uh, any claims involved um, in your previous uh, work experience? Uh, I'll jump over to surety. Um, surety is not necessarily um, an insurance product per se, but it's more like a bank product. Essentially, a third, the surety is stepping in to fulfill the obligation when you can't. Or, or you fail to finish a project. So the number one concern that the surety has is the financial strength of the firm, and obviously their track record, uh, what's going, what, what, the, what projects do they have on hand now relative to their financial strength, and obviously the claim, claims history. Uh, typically, surety should have a 0% loss ratio uh, if, they're, uh, if the underwriters are, are doing their job. Uh, and a big aspect of this is the management team. So if we are looking at a surety product, we typically sit down with the management team and the surety um, underwriters themselves and, and form a long-lasting uh, relationship uh, built on understanding. And very similar to warranty. So you'll see there's a couple of consistent themes throughout the price drivers, looking at claims history, management team, uh, previous work experience. All of these really do speak to the quality of the company the insurance company is about to put up capacity for. And warranty is no different. It's a little bit of a longer process. It looks a lot more at failure rates and claims history. The financial strength of the firm is also very important. Um, if it's a manufacturer's warranty, they want to look at the manufacturing equipment that's, that's been procured and that's going to be used in the process, how much automation that there is in that facility, what their checks and balances are, are they EL testing on the front end and, and flash testing on the back end, how are, they, how are they managing their quality control procedures, and the components within the supply chain are also incredibly important um, to understand the overall quality. We do have quite a bit of experience 
uh, in claims, and we'll run through a number here. There's actually a new one that came to my attention today that I'll get into in a minute. Um, the, the first one we've got is a commercial inst installation. In Ontario, we've seen quite a few uh, tornadoes, and there's been a few that have ripped through some areas with rooftop solar. There's a ton down in Windsor area, which is considered tornado alley, and we've seen losses totally around $600,000. Um, we've seen a commercial installation and oversized system with incorrectly matched inverters that led to arcing in a small fire. There's $50,000 worth of damaged equipment and $150,000 in loss of revenue. And that could have been much, much worse. Um, it was a commercial industrial building. If it had been something that was wood frame, we would have seen potentially a total loss. We had another commercial installation and there was a fire inside the building just before COD, about a week before it hit uh, commercial operation. And it caused total loss of an array, which was $1.2 million worth of loss of equipment. We are almost two years into the process and it's not quite yet completed. Uh, it is quite the process to go through in the event that there's a fire, especially when you have to settle a loss within a building. Uh, ground mount's a little bit different. We've had some residential installations with no critter guards that led to squirrels nesting under an array uh, over a few months. This particular claim we're noting had led to uh, subsequent water damage in the home, which was $12,000 in liability loss as the installation was actually leased, the rooftop was leased by a, another company. So it, it was under the liability, which was property damage to the third party, and the third party was the, uh, the residential homeowner. Uh, we had another residential installation with design flaws that allowed an array to be placed too close to, chimney, to a chimney, which allowed ice damming in winter, causing damage to the inside of the home, which was another $23,000 worth of liability, and that was from an installation and engineering error. Uh, that one's still being settled out as it originally fell under the liability of the installation firm because of the property damage, but as of the design flaw, they're looking at the engineer to pay that loss from a financial perspective to the insurance company and the uh, original installation company. Another residential installation, there seems to be a bit of a theme with these. Uh, we've had some trusses missed on installation due to lack of due diligence in the engineering review. Uh, water damage followed in $7,000 liability loss and $12,000 E&O loss following subrogation. Uh, another one with delamination on an entire run of solar panels from a programming error on a line led to massive uninsured product defect loss and manufacturer bankruptcy. Coverage could have been purchased through manufacturer's E&O, which is a professional liability procured by manufacturers, and or warranty coverage. However, the manufacturer viewed the cost as too great and declined purchase. Uh, the other one that I was made aware of today was a fire that occurred at the uh, connection with the switch gear in a building. So it wasn't the array itself, it was the connection to the switch gear in the building. It has caused a $900,000 loss, and they're currently settling the claim, and it's a toss-up at this point between installation error, uh, incorrect componentry, or potentially a manufacturing defect or a product defect, or materials defect, depending on, on where this does land. But those are some pretty serious, serious and expensive claims that we've seen. Um, So in, in summary, as you can see, and as I alluded to, um, you know, insurance is there to help uh, backstop your, your operations, uh, underpin your balance sheet um, should a loss occur. As you can see from those examples, um, a lot of that was out of control of the, uh, of the insured. Um, a lot of it includes liability to third parties, you'd be that property damage uh, mostly, but sometimes we, we do see bodily injury. Um, and when Jen mentioned earlier that there's a, a subrogation component, typically what we will see is when there is property damage, it's your liability or the, the installer's liability policy, as an example, um, that will kick in, but then subrogate if there was a design flaw by the contractor um, and, they, and the uh, insurance companies will sort of fight it out amongst themselves. So losses can occur. Uh, insurance is there to help. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, you can uh, put them up toward uh, up to uh, 
discussion now or uh, feel free to write us. I, I believe this presentation is being recorded uh, and our information is available to you. So with that, I'll, I'll open up, oh, do we open up the phone lines now, Guy? Thank you, Jen and Kyle. Uh, presentation uh, is particularly appreciated. Uh, as you know, uh, insurance is regularly left until the end of a project and needs to be considered for all types of business, businesses and projects. Um, if there is anybody that has any questions, uh, feel free to type them in right now. Um, I, I haven't seen any come through yet, um, but if you do have them and we don't get to anything today, feel free to give us uh, an email um, and we can uh, we can do uh, we'll, we'll, we can put you in contact with uh, with Kyle and Jen obviously um, it, unless you can do you have your uh, email that you could pop on your screen there at all Kyle or Jen? Uh, I'm not sure. There we go. Perfect. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at HES or of course at, at Hewood Canada. Um, and thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, as always, we re really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Kyle, for the presentation. Much appreciated. Thanks very much, Thanks, team. Guys. Okay, everyone, have a great day. Cheers.